So, um, I hope you're in the right room. We're at Middle School Acapella, Back to the Future. Um, kind of a funny name that I actually, uh, a college football coach at the College in New Jersey that my brother went to, always kind of had a program called Back to the Future or Back to Our Future. But uh, the reason we entitled it this is just because um, we sang acapella for so long. I mean, it's the world's first instrument, right? And, uh, and all of a sudden, kind of around the 1900s, it started to die out, and then uh, there was a slight resurgence uh, in, in popular culture, but all around the world, acapella still takes place, and America is kind of the, uh, one of the only places that, that wasn't singing acapella all the time. And so, uh, luckily for us and for all the people in your room and your students, um, it, it started to take place a lot more. Um, so we're going to talk, uh, this is just going to be a quick hit session since we only have 15 minutes. Hi, welcome. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of things today. First off, why I think acapella is important uh, to uh, become more uh, prevalent in the classroom. Um, some tricks and tips for you that you can use if you don't have a middle school acapella classroom or if you're not a choir teacher at all. Um, and, uh, and, and some tricks and tips for your students as well. Um, so first off, how many of you are middle school choir teachers? How many of you are choir teachers, period? How many of you are not choir teachers? What do you guys do? I teach general music. Okay. Awesome. Oh, great, great. Wonderful. Um, so I'm, I'm a proud middle school choir conductor, and uh, I will probably never move to high school. I genuinely believe that. Um, you know, why just middle school? People always say that. I love middle school. This is like, from the everything about me, including my height, I belong there. Um, and so, and so I'm going to stay there uh, forever because I'm not growing anymore either. Um, so uh, I love middle school. I also conduct a barber shop chorus uh, in in Minnesota called the Great Northern Union, um, which is like an internationally uh, a renowned group and I, and I absolutely love them as well um, and so acapella and and choir is uh, it was uh, bred into me and so we're gonna get started here we don't have much time um, so first off before we start have, have you guys been here for the last three days and been going to classes and tons of stuff like that great so before we even jump in we're gonna talk about why this makes sense with everything that you've heard so far this weekend okay anyone uh, in the culturally responsive education classes here at this week Wonderful. So that's something that Minnesota is diving into a lot. I'm in for that. Or here. So can acapella be taught in a uh, in a culturally responsive way? And the answer is, of course. Um, you know, uh, building relationships, maintaining relevancy, and raising rigor all, all three highly uh, anticipated aspects of uh, uh, culturally responsive teaching um, are all part of the acapella world. Okay. And so uh, there's no reason why this can't be taught in a culturally responsive manner. Um, anyone that was in the technology aspect this week. Uh, yeah, there's notation software, there's recording equipment, there's performance enhancing sound technology. Acapella means without the use of instruments, it doesn't mean without technology. And that's a really, really important distinction that we have to make. Um, there's, uh, I, I put looping machines in there, which all my friends are going to make fun of me for. It's not really a looping machine, um, but we'll just go with that. Um, and uh, is this in accordance with the state standards? Well, yeah, because we're performing and we're creating and, uh, and we're responding and we're teaching. And so uh, teaching acapella and, and doing acapella within your classroom, uh, no matter if you're general ed or band or, or choir, doesn't matter. And then, so is this just for choral music educators? And I'm really, really glad that we have four general music educators or, or some other thing in the room. Um, we, if anyone was at the experimental band program the other day, I would say every other example that they did was actually singing a cappella. He would, he would have the band, do, ti, do, and they would sing it, and then they would play it. And it was magical seeing that transition from singing to playing and how much better the playing got after they sang. So it's just a really important note um, to make. As we move forward, uh, why is this relevant? There's a huge resurgence of acapella in our social media today. Social media is taking over the world. I'm sure you know that because you have students of some kind. It's on TV. I'm just going to give you some uh, examples. You're welcome to take a picture of this or at the end send me an email and I'll show you the presentation or we can talk further. But there are tons of television shows that are showing our kids and our students and each other, of course, um, how cool acapella is. It really is. Um, on the big screens, Pitch Perfect. These are some really, really popular ensembles that have come out um, within the last couple of years, uh, Pentatonix being the first a cappella Grammy Award winner. And they don't consider themselves a choral group, you know that, right? They consider themselves a band, a band without instruments. 
Um, and so that's just a really cool way to think about it. And then um, I'm gonna give you a couple Barbershop Harmony Society things today. I promise I don't work for the Barbershop Harmony Society. I'm just a really proud barbershopper. But uh, here's some really popular videos. Uh, Main Street's um, pop songs medley where they literally sang songs from our or my generation. Um, the Ambassadors of Harmony 76 trombones. Uh, GQ's uh, Something Tells Me I'm Into Something Good and the Newfangled Fours Quartet, literally everything they do thanks to Reddit, uh, it just becomes viral every time they do anything um, and they're, they're a bunch of funny guys too. Really relatable, really relatable. Does anyone have any other examples that you can think of that aren't up here right now just for each other? That was a question that came up a lot in the last session, just examples, right? Anybody else? Yeah. Vintage Mix. Uh, vintage mix is, is quadruplets actually I think they're 17 years old now they're from Wisconsin and they're quadruplets that sing um, popular acapella and, and barbershop and they're incredible absolutely incredible anybody else okay so why why should we put it in our schools why put it in your in your classroom in K through 12 I, I understand that we're not all middle school teachers um, so first off it builds community one of the reasons that I stopped playing football, no offense if you're a sports person here, go sports, right? Um, uh, but uh, one of the reasons I stopped playing football outside of my height was because I didn't actually feel that community that was always associated with sports. I actually felt too much competition. I felt like everyone was trying to be better than each other. And in my choir world in high school, I didn't feel that at all. I felt like we were all there working together to make something special happen. It wasn't one man or woman or or non, uh, non-conforming person out for themselves. It was everyone for the team. What kind of product can we make? And so acapella really builds communities. Um, the Barbershop Harmony Society, Sweet Adelines, Harmony Incorporated, CASA, there's all, I mean, NAFME, there are all these incredible music communities out there, and uh, acapella is just, is just one more. Obviously, the relevant and modern examples that we talked about just now, and I, I would be willing to bet just because it's Wednesday and it's early morning that there were a bunch more examples and just no one raised their hand, so that's okay. But I have a feeling that there are more. It builds confidence in your students. Those quadruplets that we just talked about, Vintage Mix, they've been performing since they were like 12 together. Um, one of my favorite stories, and I, I know I'm talking really, really fast. If you miss anything, we'll have a little bit of time to debrief, but um, one of my favorite stories is I was working up in Harlem uh, teaching at a charter school called Democracy Prep. And I, I brought a quartet of young students down to a, a choral competition or convention. And, uh, and many years later, I, you know, I moved away, and now they're seniors in high school, and they just won the New York State Speech and Debate Tournament. And these are kids that like would hardly even talk in class kind of kids. And, and so just introducing them into a world where everyone's going to embrace you and it's okay to be vulnerable because it's acapella and you can't hide behind anything and introducing them into this world really kind of set the set the path for the future for them they they knew they could be performers they knew people would like what they were doing right and it doesn't hurt that they were really super talented too it is the best ear training course in the entire world acapella music um you, I, I saw this in my college time and time again. The people that were involved in acapella learning how to tune chords by, oh, you're three cents flat. That's a, a, anyone acapella dorks in here that like always get that. Yeah, you're three cents flat. It's a real thing. When you're tuning a chord, especially a four part, but anything, when you're tuning a chord, you have to be really, really in tune with one another. And I don't just mean your voices. You have to be in tune with one another emotionally as well in order to get the lock and ring that you're looking for in contemporary acapella or any acapella beyond that, you know. Um, so uh, it's the best year training course in the world. And then it's really, really good preparation for real world musicianship. We don't always have instruments. We don't always have something that we need. It, uh, when we're up in front of a classroom uh, with budgets cutting and, and all that kind of stuff that, that we don't really want to talk about here. But you're not always gonna have a classroom full of instruments. You're not always gonna have a classroom full of equipment. And so sometimes your voice is all you have and you need to be able to use that um, if you're gonna be a music educator, in my opinion, I should say. And then uh, this is a shout out to Jerry uh, Shiel. Uh, was anyone in the hip hop class the other day? He said that hip hop was the brainchild of postmodernism and minimalism. And if, if, if that's true, then I am gonna argue that acapella music is like the OG, uh, called the original genre here. 
not just the original, but the original genre. Because after all, it's like the most minimalistic music you could possibly have, right? There was nothing before The Voice. And so uh, I, I just, that's just a shout out to Jarrett, but I'm gonna say that we are more postmodernistic and more minimalistic than any genre out there because we're just using our voices and each other. Um, so, uh, quick best practices for your students. First off, um, a reminder that, it, that it's up to us to give each individual member of our course or ensemble the knowledge and power and tools to critique the course as a whole, right? Uh, this will in turn give your students confidence to not only do the right thing when they're in the ensemble, but understand what's being asked of them as well. So you have to front load them with a ton of information. Uh, all the examples that I gave you before, all the performances, if you can bring in live performances, the more you can give them, the better. Again, kind of referencing back to the gospel session that a lot of us were just in. I mean, if you weren't, you missed a great session. It was awesome. Um, but one of the questions was asked, well, how do I teach my accompanist how to play gospel piano? And the answer is exactly the same. They need to listen more. You need to listen to more acapella. You need to listen to more barbershop. You need to listen to more gospel, whatever have you. Whenever you're trying to learn something, our first instinct as humans should be to copy what has come before us and to learn from that. There's nothing wrong with that. Whoa. Um, coaching under glass. So this is something that I do uh, fairly often with my middle school choir. I actually bring in a coach um, to, to work with the students and oftentimes I will let the coach work with one section of the students while everyone else watches and just gives feedback and reflects and comments. St. Louis Park being an international baccalaureate school, we talk a lot about reflection and a lot about personal ownership. And so when we bring in a coach and they get to actually watch how they're learning, then in turn they become the coach. Half and half, half the class listens, half the class critiques. These, these are nothing new if you've been an educator, but it's just things that you might not have thought about doing in an acapella world. Um, when there's only 13 people in the room and everyone has their own part, well, what happens if half the class drops out? I'm gonna say that's okay. You're gonna make stronger musicians from it. Students as peer coaches, empower students sing to lead. That's an obvious one, I hope. Video critique and responding to their own personal performances. I had a coach, his name was Gary Plagg, and uh, one of the very first things he did with, with my ensemble was he taped our entire session and then we had to watch our entire session. I, I kid you not, I can't tell you how many times I did this during the song. I don't know why. Oh, all right, so we're laughing. You did something like that? I can't, I was just doing this. I don't know why. Acapella people, we like to move, we like to groove. My thing was this. And, and after, about, after about 20 minutes, I looked at the ensemble and I had to apologize to these guys. I was like, I'm sorry, I looked like an idiot, but it, it's really, really powerful. Watching yourself, being your own worst critic, um, in a constructive way, obviously, so you're gonna have to teach how to do that. And best practices and reminders for you, the educator. Remember to be silly and vulnerable, put yourself out there, and start letting uh, the students in on who you are immediately. Uh, this seems weird, but my Facebook is completely open for the world to see, and my students creep on me all the time, and that's okay. They can look at everything in my life. They know my wife, they know my parents because we're all open on Facebook and we try to lead the best examples of our own lives as we can, right? So let your students in. Be silly, be vulnerable, do this every once in a while. It'll be great, I promise, okay? Um, remember that no matter what, everything that is said, shown, or demonstrated, ultimately taught, uh, uh, from the second your students step into that door is your responsibility and it creates a relationship no matter what. Uh, no pressure, of course. <laughs> That's a really, really deep statement. One of my favorite examples was um, I was teaching up in Harlem, and a teacher was talking about the farmer's market and how every apple costed $3, and my kids couldn't get past that. Like, A, what's a farmer's market, and why am I going to pay $3 for an apple? Right? It had nothing to do, like, that wasn't the point. The point was math, right? But you teach who you are. This is, we're, we're talking about cult culturally responsive education a lot this week. You teach who you are, and so you have to be sure that you're, you're, you're teaching who you are and you know that, and you're really understanding why you're teaching the things that you're teaching, right? And be real. So for you, um, or I'm sorry, for me, barbershop and acapella are two of the tools that I use um, because it's what I grew up in in the choral world, actually. Um, and they're the easiest pathways for me, so I can be very real when I'm teaching acapella. I can be myself. I can say stupid things and silly things, and the kids get to laugh with me instead of at me, 
where I, well, actually that's not true. They laugh at me most of the time, um, but we laugh together sometimes. Um, I was actually a Latin and African percussionist for my entire life, all the way through college, and I watched a barbershop video out of nowhere, and it hooked me for life. Me and a bunch of my friends, they brought me into a chorus rehearsal, and these guys just embraced me, and I decided I wanted to be a choral nerd for the rest of my life, and, uh, and then I ended up focusing on barbershop and acapella, and of course, I started to do much more in the choral world, but this is kind of my home is barbershop and acapella, so it's really easy for me to teach and to ground it. So whatever's easiest for you to teach. And build relationships through song and realness. This is really hard to do as an educator, but I put a quote in here that I remember um, from three years ago, and I was talking to my students about how this song kind of made me really, really lonely. And, uh, and I had to be vulnerable for a second, um, but a lot of the students said, been there, done that with me. When I said, you know, who's been there and done that? They'll go, been there, done that. Right? Just because they're in 6th, 7th, 8th grade or whatever grade you teach doesn't mean that they haven't had lonely times in their lives where they can really connect to an acapella song or to any song, right? But, but specifically to acapella music where we're asking you to be a lot more vulnerable than you're normally used to, putting yourself out there. Um, and then uh, raising the rigor, right? Students will be proud of their excellence and there's nothing wrong with demanding excellence. Um, so by this time, I hope that you've already realized I've done one, two, one, bullet point, seven B. Um, this is just like part of me being silly and stupid. Kids love this. So I actually didn't write this as a bullet point, but best practices for you, be you. If I walked up there and I had my students do like one, two, three, four, five, they'd be bored immediately. But I hope that this was engaging for some of you like it was for my students. It's like, why did he do that? There's no reason whatsoever. Well, and I really, really suck at PowerPoints. That's the other reason, um, if I'm being honest. Um, so uh, the never-ending question of repertoire, how are we doing on time? You're technically done, but you said that. 26, jeez, okay. Um, so every selection should be chosen to help build up your singers. Um, they need repertoire uh, that warms up, that they can relate to, um, that serves a purpose, um, and that is accomplishable or smart. Um, so there's a bunch of different reasons for it, significant, meaningful, attainable, rewarding, tractable. Um, tags, codas, codettes, or codettas rather, um, which is just the end of a song. It's the most fun part of a song in the barbershop world and most of the times in the acapella world, but they have to be able to do this. And just because you're teaching middle school doesn't mean that you can't do four-part harmony, I promise. But if it has to be three-part or two-part, so be it. That's okay. Get them started, meet them where they're at, right? Meeting where they're at, solfege or numbers, lyrics or vowels, whatever you're going to do, it doesn't really matter when it comes to acapella. It's whatever the students are gonna feel most grounded in and they're gonna hear the most success in themselves in, right? So teach the students, um, teach the students that you have, not the students that you want. That's something that we heard this week, right? And so make sure you're really meeting them where they're at. In my opinion, um, I've used solfege or numbers so much more successfully than just the vowel ah, uh, believe it or not. Believe it or not, it's, it's easier for students to connect to. And then um, for contemporary acapella, you're obviously gonna do contemporary popular rep or just simply re relatable music, but be brave and, and learn to appreciate their music, right? Just because you don't love it doesn't mean that they won't, and vice versa. I, I, I can't tell you how many kids have asked me about James Taylor since I started teaching middle school, which is the weirdest thing ever, um, but, but it's great. They, they will end up liking your music too. Okay, so since we have no more time, here are some really quick resources. The Barbershop Harmony Society, Sweet Ads, Harmony Inc. CASA, the Recording Acapella Review, everything else in the world. Um, this is all my information if you have any questions at all. I know we have like zero minutes left, but are there any, th is there anything that you're just dying to know right now that you didn't get from my really long-winded presentation? Yeah. Yeah, and that's totally fine. What I would encourage is that you get a kid that can beatbox. I guarantee you there's one at your school. But yeah, yeah, I work it all the time where, where I either have students playing like a bucket drum or working with a beat that's already recreated um, on, on a simulator or like online or something all the time. Yeah, I actually had a video to show you that now I can't, but <laughs> anything else? Guys, thank you so much for being with me today. Good luck with everything in the future. Thank you. Thanks.